Welcome everyone. Today it is my special pleasure to introduce a former docent at the Nevada Historical Society and a graduate from West Point, Anne Davis. Anne served on active duty in the Army for 29 years in various locations and in various leadership positions and retired as Colonel. She commanded the Hawthorne Army Depot here in Nevada from 2000 to, through 2002. Anne has an MBA from Harvard Business School and a PhD from the City University of New York. Since retirement, Anne has been involved in veterans issues in Nevada and nationally. At the Nevada Historical Society, Anne gave tours in the gallery for Art Town from 2015 through 2018 on the topic of federal presence and gaming. Friends and volunteers, I give you Anne Davis. All right. Well, good morning and welcome to this presentation on Nevada's military women. As an Army veteran, I find this to be an important and interesting topic and I hope you do too. First, I think it's important for us to define who or what I mean when we talk about Nevada's military women. There's no one way to define this. Is it women from Nevada, women who served in Nevada? Today, I'm going to be inclusive and define this term very broadly to include military women who have done historic things within the state of Nevada, those born in Nevada who have done things outside of the state, and women who served or supported the military only to make their way back to Nevada later in life. Why not claim credit for all of those women? The second thing I think is important is to frame this presentation within the greater context of women's roles in the United States military to best understand how those roles have changed over time. So when did women first enter military service? Well, not officially part of the military, women have served for as long as our country has been around. In 1782, the Revolutionary War raged on. Deborah Sampson disguised herself as a man named Robert Shirtliff, joined the 4th Massachusetts Regiment, and was given the dangerous task of scouting neutral territory to assess the British buildup of men and material in Manhattan, which General George Washington contemplated attacking. In June of 1782, Sampson and two sergeants led about 30 infantrymen on an expedition that ended with a confrontation with the Tories, and she led a raid on a Tory home that resulted in the capture of 15 men. At the siege of Yorktown, she dug trenches, helped storm a British redoubt, and endured cannon fire. For over two years, Sampson's true sex escaped uh, detection, despite several close calls. During one skirmish, she received a gash on her forehead from a sword and was shot in her left thigh, but she extracted the pistol ball herself. She was ultimately discovered in Philadelphia when she became ill during an ep epidemic, was taken to a hospital and lost consciousness. She received a military pension from the state of Massachusetts, one of very few women to receive a military pension at that time. During the War of 1812, women served mainly as camp followers, providing services such as laundress, seamstress, cooks, and nurses. Most women stayed at home to take care of farm and family while their husbands, brothers, and sons hung. Some wives become soldiers. However, there was a lottery at times to decide, to decide how many wives were able to go with their husbands during these battle campaigns. The number was even as low as six wives per 100 soldiers. So I'm not sure if I would have liked to have been a winner of that lottery. Nevada became the 36th state by entering the union as a free state on October 31st of 1864, after telegraphing the Constitution of Nevada to the Congress days before the November of 1864 presidential election. It's the largest and costliest transmission ever by telegraph at that time. Statehood was rushed to help ensure three electoral votes for Abraham Lincoln's reelection and to add to the Republican congressional majorities. Nevada's main contribution to the Civil War cause came from its burgeoning mining industry. And at least 400 million in silver ore from the Comstock load was used to finance the federal war effort. Nevada had scarcely 7,000 Americans according to the 1860 US census, but they raised 1,200 soldiers for the Union cause. During the Civil War, Nevada suffered a total of 33 killed, 
29 that died as a result of disease. Two were mortally wounded while fighting Indians at the Battle of Table Mountain in Humboldt, Nevada. One died from an accident and one died from causes other than battle. During the Civil War, some women were on the battlefields, but many women stayed at home. Usually when men went off to fight, women were left with the responsibilities for farms, ranches, homes, and businesses. The first and only woman to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor was Dr. Mary Walker, who was a contract surgeon during the war. Dr. Walker led an unconventional life for a woman of the mid 19th century. She became a doctor when few women were even credentialed in nursing. Divorced in an era when women's positions were primarily defined by wifehood and motherhood, she advocated for dress reform for women and even wore men's clothing to, to lecture on women's rights. Walker was eventually appointed Assistant Surgeon in the Army of the Cumberland. And after the war, President Andrew Johnson awarded her the Congressional Medal of Honor based on the recommendations of Major Generals uh, Sherman and Thomas. And as a result of her service to the Union during the Civil War, Mary Walker was paid $766.16 and provided a monthly pension that was lower than most of the war widows. Clara Barton is known as the Florence, Florence Nightingale of the United States. She worked with field surgeons during several major battles of the Civil War. And as the war ended, she helped locate thousands of missing soldiers, including identifying the dead at Andersonville Prison in Georgia. Barton lobbied for US recognition of the International Committee of the Red Cross and became president of the American branch when it was founded in 1881. While there was no local Red Cross branch in Nevada during the Civil War, there was the Sanitary Commission which sought to find ways to help the wounded, sick, and disabled soldiers in the war. The contributions by Western states, including Nevada, was through fundraising to keep the Sanitary Commission afloat. The picture on the lower left of the slide is a fancy dress ball held by the women of Carson City to raise money for the U.S. Sanitary Commission. The fancy dress ball featured a fundraising gimmick, a sack of flour that was continually auctioned off for high prices and then donated back to be sent to another ladies aid society. On April 30th of 1917, little more than three weeks after the United States entered World War I, Nevada had already supplied its entire quota of men for the draft. Draft totals from 1917 to February of 1918 numbered 1,447, which exceeded the quota of 162 men by 900%. Since women were not allowed to enlist in the service, there were no women included in this number. One significant change to women's service during World War I is that American civilian women donned uniforms. The uniform allowed women to look the part and to claim credibility for their service, as well as to be taken seriously by others. Many women saw their wartime service as a way to claim full citizenship. But women assisted in the war effort in a variety of ways. The Girls of Sparks High School formed the state's first patriotic league in September of 1917. The young women collected magazines for military hospitals overseas and assisted the Red Cross. Later that year, the Patriotic League was recognized for its efforts, which included knitting garments, assembling Christmas packages, and raising funds for the Red Cross. Throughout the state, Nevada's women volunteered their time and energy for the war effort. Joining women across the country, they formed their own branches of such organizations as the, as the State and National Councils of Defense, the Liberty Loan Committee, Department of Educational Propaganda and Patriotic Education, and state chapters of the Federation of Women's Clubs. World War I changed traditional gender roles by allowing women to take part in activities other than women's groups. Under the auspices of self-defense or war vigilance, some formed their own gun clubs or home guard units, while others joined men's organizations, such as the American Protective League. One of those women was Frances Freidhoff. For the entire duration of World War I, she served upon the Council of Defense with the Red Cross and as secretary of the Lyon County Four Minute Men. The Four Minute Men were a group of volunteers authorized by United States President Woodrow Wilson to give four minute speeches on topics given to them by the Committee on Public Information. In 1917 and 18, over 750,000 speeches were given in over 5,200 communities by over 70,000 accomplished orators, including men, women, and children. 
reaching about 400 million listeners. The topics dealt with the American war effort and were presented during the four minutes between reels, changing a movie theaters across the country. Also, the speeches were made to be four minutes so that they could be given at town meetings, at restaurants and other places that had an audience. Several years after contributions to the war effort, Mrs. Freidhoff became the first woman to serve as the Nevada State Senator in 1935. And in France, 223 American women, popularly known as the Hello Girls, served as long distance switchboard operators for the US Army Signal Corps. The Hello Girls maintained communications in 75 French localities, sometimes working under combat conditions. They included two Nevada women, Amelyn Jackson of Aurora and Margaret Hope Curvin of Reno. When some of the Hello Girls dared to claim veterans benefits, they were met with blank bewilderment followed by irate refusal. Some of the women persisted, however, and for almost 60 years. And in 1977, when the youngest of them was nearing 80 years of age, they won recognition as veterans. World War I was the first time in American history in which women were officially attached to arms of the American military. The first American women to enlist into the regular armed forces were 13,000 women admitted into active duty in the Navy. They served in stateside jobs and received the same benefits and responsibilities as men, including identical pay, which was $28.75 per month. These women were quickly demobilized when hostility ceased and aside from the nurse corps, the uniform army and Navy once again became exclusively male. Now this wouldn't be a military briefing uh, if we didn't have some acronyms. Uh, it was during World War II that women officially became a part of the military. Because of the large number of personnel needed to fight and support World War II, more women became involved. And about 70% of the women who served in the military during World War II held traditionally female jobs. They worked as typists, clerks, and mail sorters. By filling office jobs that would otherwise be held by men, women, women freed more men to fight, and women were not permitted to participate in armed conflict. The Army, as well as all of the services, do not want to accept women directly. Following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, the Army established the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, and that was later converted to the Women's Army Corps, more, more popularly known as the WACs, in 1943, and they were recognized as an official part of the regular Army. The Air Force had the Women Air Force Service Pilots, known as WASPs, and that later became the Women Air Forces. The Navy had the WAVES, the Women's Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Services. In 1942, the Coast Guard established their women's reserve, known as the SPARS, after the motto, Semper Paratus, always ready. And in 1943, the Marine Corps created the, women's Corps, the Marine Corps' Women Reserve. Women performed admirably in every conceivable job. They suffered casualties and yet were denied full military status. The U.S. decided not to use women in combat because public opinion would not tolerate it. In the picture in the center, it shows President Barack Obama, who in 2009 awarded all of the surviving WASPs the Congressional Gold Medal. Here are some of Nevada's women that served in World War II. When Helen Cannon graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, she began working as a teacher and began saving all of her extra money to pay for flying lessons. She soon realized that flying was her passion and she took a job at a local airport in South Dakota to get more flying time. During World War II, she enlisted in the Women Air Force Service Pilot, the WASPs. Only around 1,000 women could serve in this capacity, and Cannon was very conscious of, at the time of the gender discrimination with the women pilots faced. She never complained, though, out of a sense of patriotism and because she treasured her time as a pilot regardless of the circumstances. While serving as a test pilot at Luke Field Air Base in Arizona, Helen met her husband, Bob. They were married in Los Angeles and in 1956, 40, 1946, moved to Las Vegas. Cannon was a community leader in Las Vegas for over 60 years. She was involved in numerous local service organizations, including the Junior League, the United Fund, and the PTA. She's also very interested in local education, serving as clerk, vice president, and then president of the Clark County School Board 
and president of the Nevada State School Board Association. While serving on the school board, she oversaw the creation of the Free School Lunch Program, the Southern Nevada Vocational School, and KLVX TV, the local public access station. Throughout her life, she maintained an interest in her passion for flying. And in 1961, she flew in the women's coast to coast air race known as the Powder Puff Derby. During World War II, Margaret Gee took flying lessons with the hope of joining the WASPs as well. With Nevada being the West Coast line of defense, the US prohibited private pilots from flying within 100 miles of the West Coast. So she traveled from California to Minden, Nevada for her flying lessons. Upon completion, WASP recruiters accepted her into the program and ordered her to report for seven months of training in Sweetwater, Texas. Upon graduation, Gee was assigned to the Las Vegas Army Airfield where she dealt with male pilots who felt that women, especially one of Chinese ancestry, had no place in the service. He instructed male pilots in instrument flying, evaluated pilots renew renewing their instrument ratings, and co-piloted B-17s during gunnery practice using live ammunition. He served in this capacity until the Army Air Corps disbanded the WASP program on December 20th of 1944. For her role as one of the first women in history to fly American military aircraft in defense of America's freedom, Margaret Gee earned her place in the Nevada Aerospace Hall of Fame. Phyllis Bender was born in, in Reno, Nevada in March 7th of 1919, a third generation Nevada whose grandparents emigrated to Lovelock from Denmark and established the Anker Ranch in 1877, a ranch that is still in her family today. As a member of the Pershing County High School class of 1937, she was an accomplished pianist and earned her University of Nevada, to Nevada tuition by playing piano gigs, tutoring, and holding various summer jobs on campus. She re received her bachelor's and master's degree in education from UNR. And after graduation, she taught business for the Eureka County School District in Yarrington High School. Phyllis enlisted in the Women's Army Corps in June of 1943 and rose to the rank of staff sergeant. In 1944, she was assigned to Chief of Staff General George Marshall's office at the Pentagon. Being fluent in French, Phyllis accompanied General Marshall to the 1944, 1944 Roosevelt Churchill Conference in Quebec, Canada. Louise Alois Smith was born in Lovelock, Nevada. As World War II progressed, she enlisted in the Women's Army Corps in 1943. She had changed achieved the rank of sergeant while serving as a recruiter and rehabilitation counselor in military hospitals until her discharge in 1946. During this time, she learned compassion and the importance of community service. As a WAC, she was awarded the World War II Victory Medal, the Good Conduct Medal, and the American Campaign Medal. After World War II, many women returned to homemaker duties, but Louise Smith searched for opportunities to to apply her knowledge that she had gained in the Army. She decided to put her Army experience to use and she ran for Assemblyman from Pershing County. She was elected to the Nevada Assembly in 1949 and re-elected in 1951. As an Assemblyman, she served on eight standing committees, including Veteran Affairs, Legislative Functions, Social Welfare, State Library, and State Publicity. Leadership positions at the time were awarded to women mainly for ceremonial purposes. However, following her reelection in 1951, Louise had the honor of being the first woman elected as speaker pro tempore of the assembly by her fellow assemblymen. Most people uh, have heard of Rosie the Riveter, but on a local level, Southern, Southern Nevada had its own version of hardworking wartime women known as Magnesium Maggies. The term was coined by a researcher and former war worker, Irene Rothstein. With the manpower shortages of World War II, women took jobs throughout the local economy, which had formerly been associated with men. The largest group of women worked at the basic magnesium plant in Henderson, Nevada. Women drove forklifts, were full-fledged machinists, and worked over molten metal, stacking and shipping the magnesium to the factories where the ingots would be turned into tracer bullets and aerial flares and incendiary bombs for the machine guns and bomb bays of Allied aircraft. The woman known, a woman named Thelma Lindquist was dubbed Chlorine Kate because she operated a cell that made chlorine gas, hydrogen, and caustic soda, 
which were used in the magnesium manufacturing product ma manufacturing process and sold as byproducts. Workers who ran these cells had to wear rubber shoes to prevent electrocution from the electrodes were, that were operating in the tanks of brine, and they had to carry a gas mask at all times. Temperatures reached 130 degrees in that section in the summer, and in the winter, it was so cold the women would crawl on top of the cells to get warm, even though it was dangerous and forbidden. So the job was so rough that, rough that most people lasted only one day, but Thelma Lindquist stuck it out both through war and peace until her retirement in 1955. The women's safety record was better than the men's, but they tended to get hurt in different ways. They dropped things on their feet, they were hit by an object or they tripped, the kind of thing that happens to you when you are not used to a factory setting and find yourself in one, said Rothstein. Economic opportunity was an important reason women worked in the war industries, but patriotism was also a strong motivation. Most of the magnesium Maggies enjoyed their first taste of equal pay for equal work, generally 90 cents an hour for the Henderson production workers. Even those women who went back to their homes after the war cut a path for other women. They did jobs that were men's jobs before. While breakthrough into management remained in the future, the door to industrial employment would never again be so tightly closed as it had been in pre-war days. After a year of bitter congressional and public debate, President Harry Truman signed the Women's Armed Services Integration Act of 1948, establishing a permanent place for women, other than the nurses who were already permanent in the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps. The drive to recruit women into the US Armed Forces and the gradual implementation of racial, racial desegregation in the military, however, were at odds with social trends of the early 1950s. When the Korean War began in 1950, the United States found itself involved in a conflict for which it was unprepared. A downsized military establishment rushed to call up, draft, and recruit the needed manpower. And when it came up short, the services asked American women to leave their homes, jobs, and families and serve their country during a time of need, just as, as they had in previous wars. That the military offered women far more restricted opportunities than it had during World War II. During the 1950s, the opportunities for any but traditional jobs declined significant, significantly. For more than half the women worked in pink collar positions, such as personnel and administration, and their basic training included stereotypical women's classes such as makeup and etiquette lessons. A 1951 Army recruiting pamphlet promised in authorizing job assignments for women, particular care is taken to see that the job does not involve any type of duty that violates the concept of proper employment for sisters and girlfriends. In the military transport field, for example, women do not drive heavy trucks. The policy on pregnancy and seesawing policies on marriage further contributed to women's attrition rates. Discharge for pregnancy was automatic and mothers of children under the age of 18 were not permitted to volunteer. Lack of equality in the dependent entitlements such as family housing and medical care also made the military less attractive to women. For the remainder of the 1950s, the recruitment and retention of women entered a state of near inertia. The all-male draft and absence of official policy and directives of encouraging the use of women, the family unfriendly policies and societal attitudes toward women's roles contributed to serious doubts on one hand and ambivalence on the other about the value of women's programs to defense forces. Women responded to those failures by staying away. Most of the participation by women during the Korean War was as nurses in mass units or aboard hospital ships like the USS Benevolence. More than 250,000 women served in America during the Vietnam War. Thousands were stationed in Japan, Guam, Hawaii, the Philippines, or stateside hospitals. Women served off Vietnam's coast on the hospital ships such as the USS Repose and the USS Sanctuary. But 85% of the women who served in Vietnam were nurses. Catherine Barron of Nevada is a retired master sergeant with the US Air Force. She was one of the women who did not serve as a nurse. When she enlisted, she had them put in writing that she would be working on a flight line. She wanted to do more than tend to soldiers' wounds. She held them to that and became the first woman to work on that flight line. 
Before going to Vietnam, women were given mock setups of battlefield casualties. This was supposed to prepare them for the real war and the real casualties. The women also got field training, which consisted of how to fire an M16 rifle. Ironically, though, the women were never allowed to carry these weapons. While not focused on military women, I did come across one other story that I found to be uniquely Nevada. On the afternoon of August 26 of 1965, with no advance public notice, President Johnson signed Executive Order 11241, eliminating the marriage exception for the draft, but grandfathering in those already married on or before the effective date of the order that afternoon. They gave them until midnight. On the East Coast, they were largely out of luck. Most counties required a cooling off period between getting a marriage license and getting married. But out West, the wedding window was bigger. Not only did the time change work in their favor, but Nevada was already famous for same day licenses, no blood tests and no, no weight weddings. The matrimonial mobilization from Canada began immediately. Most couples came from Los Angeles and the Las Vegas Justice of the Peace, James Brennan told the Associated Press at the time, but I've had a few calls from New Jersey, Kansas City, and Chicago from people asking how long we'll be open. One of the couples he married that night came on a charter plane from Newark, New Jersey. As midnight nears, those at the back of the line grew visibly anxious, said Brennan, who made $8 per ceremony. He picked up the pace by clipping off a few more lines from his spiel. At 11.40 p.m., he remembered the way lawmakers up in the State House in Carson City were known to extend the legal day when it suited their purposes. So he directed his two assistants to cover the courtroom clock with a typewriter cover. If it was good enough for the state legislature, it was good enough for a two-bit judge in Las Vegas, he said. Not a shame that at least a few of the marriages timestamped August 26 were in fact performed a few minutes into August 27th. During the Cold War, the country relied on selective service system to draft enough young men, but the armed services maintained women volunteers needed to be smarter and more qualified than these men to perform the jobs open to them. Recruiting brochures prom promised challenging jobs with unlimited opportunities for women, but most of the truly challenging technical jobs were closed to women. And those already trained and experienced in technical skills such as engine repair, equipment maintenance, intelligence, weather and radio operations were retrained for jobs the military considered to be women's work. In the Army, WACs no longer underwent bivouac training or weapons familiarization. Air Force recruits were told how to apply lipstick correctly. And women Marines were told their lipstick and nail polish had to match the scarlet braid on their uniform hats. Their careers were further limited because women were allowed few promotion opportunities and none could serve as generals or admirals. It was not until 1967, after years of debate and pressure from various military advisory groups that Congress voted to allow women's promotions to higher grades, including general and admiral, and removing the 2% ceiling on women's military strength. Despite advocating the bill, the Armed Services Committee of the US House of Representatives stated, there cannot be complete equality between men and women in the matter of military careers. The stern demands of combat sea duty and other types of assignments directly related to combat are not placed upon women in our society. But women were making small strides. All of the federal service academies were directed to enroll women students by 1976. But it's interesting to note that the two private military colleges, the Citadel and the Virginia Military Institute did not open their doors to women until 1995 and 1997 respectively. That's 20 years after the Federal Service Academies were opened. So while I graduated from West Point in 1982 with the third class of women, I received my appointment from Michigan. I was curious as to who the first women were to graduate from the Naval Air Force and Military Academies. Unfortunately, due to privacy reasons, I was unable to determine who the women were from the Air Force and Navy, but I had better luck with my alma mater. This is Karen Fish, now Karen Hallett. She was the first woman to, from Nevada to graduate from West Point in 1988. After completing her service obligation, she left the military only to return later when she became a, a chaplain in the Army Reserve. She is known as a chaplain with a dog. Her, name, her dog's name is Sergeant Zoe, who is a psychiatric service dog trained to help people dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. 
In total, Nevada has had 18 women graduated from West Point, and there are currently five women cadets from Nevada at West Point. While women entered the service academy, many more were entering through reserve officer training corps programs known as ROTC all across the country. And women were seen in more and more units in all military services. I have not been able to determine who the women, first women were in the state's ROTC programs, but a Women's Army Corps milestone took place in 1967 when Captain Lois A. Henry became the first WAC member assigned to the cadre of any ROTC unit. And that happened at the University of Nevada, Reno. The number of both enlisted and officer women in all services continued to increase. And we begin to see a few small conflicts emerge. This is where we started to see the battlefield, battlefield change. Women's opportunities were opening up and women were on the ground with men. But the big question were, what the big question was, were women in combat? In 1983, more than 200 army women participated in the invasion of Grenada, but they were not considered having been in combat. In the 1989 Panama invasion, at the time the largest US military action since Vietnam, women soldiers gained a new visibility. Almost 800 participated, con constituting about 4% of the total force. A female captain of a US military police unit, Linda Br Bray became a celebrity after leading her unit in capturing a military dog kennel, which was actually a concealed weapons storage location in a half hour firefight. The Pentagon first played up her story, which was receiving favorable media coverage. However, when her story threatened to unleash political forces that would exert pressure to lift the combat exclusion law for women, Pentagon officials reportedly leaked disinformation to undermine her account. Captain Bray faced persistent harassment after the episode she left the army in 1991, but her role ignited the debate over the role of women in the military. Mobilization for the Gulf War included an unprecedented proportion of women from the active services, 7%, as well as reserve and national guard, 17%. It was the largest female deployment in US history. Over 40,000 US military women served in key combat support positions throughout the Persian Gulf region. Women in Desert Storm did everything the male troops did except engage in ground combat. They could essentially get fired upon. They just weren't, by existing regulations, allowed to shoot back. However, here's a quote from someone who was there on the way it really was. She said, I was a female paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne Division during Desert Shield Desert Storm. I want to make you aware of the fact that the females in the 82nd were among the ground troops that pushed into Iraq during the ground war and we most definitely could shoot back. In 2010, the Army created cultural support teams called CSTs, a secret pilot program to insert women alongside special operations soldiers in Afghanistan. The Army reasoned that women could play a, a unique role on special ops teams, accompanying their, male, accompanying their male colleagues on raids. And while those soldiers were searching for insurgents, the women could question mothers, sisters, daughters, and wives living in the compound. The presence of the women on these teams had a calming effect on enemy households, but more importantly, they were able to search adult women for weapons and gather crucial intelligence. They could build relationships in a way that, in a way that male soldiers in an Islamic country never could. The women who volunteered for the six and a half month deployment took a 10 week course at Camp Pendleton in California where they were trained for any possible situation. The pioneers of the CSTs proved for the first time, at least to some special operations soldiers, that women might be physically and mentally tough enough to become one of them. Kat Kalin, who was raised in Elko, Nevada, was a recruiter with the Nevada National Guard when she volunteered for the cultural support team. I hoped to see myself when I went to Fort Bragg for training. I hoped to see women who were competitive and hungry and wanted something bigger than what their home units offered. The integration of women into the special operations missions was not about gender, Kaylin said. It's about your capability and if you can do the job correctly. That's how we went over the Rangers. It wasn't about proving a point. Uh, Kaylin from Elko is pictured in the left in the photo on the lower right in this slide. And there's also a book called Ashley's War uh, by Gail Lemon 
which talks about the cultural support teams and the first ones uh, to go uh, into Afghanistan. It's really a, a very interesting book. Women in all branches continue to serve every day. Currently over 214,000 women are serving on active duty with an additional 588,000 serving in the reserves and National Guard. And women have become an integral part of our armed forces. In January of 2016, all Defense Department positions opened to women without exception. For the first time in US military history, as long as they qualify and meet specific standards, the Secretary of Defense said that women will be able to contribute to the mission with no barriers at all in their way. And so we have begun to see a lot of new firsts for women in all of the services. Here we see the Army's first two women Rangers, the Marines' first infantry officer, the Air Force's first woman to join the Thunderbirds, and the Navy recently se selected Captain Amy Bauerschmidt to command a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, the USS Abraham Lincoln. I want to talk about a few of the Nevada National Guard first. The Adjutant General of Nevada is a senior officer of the Nevada National Guard overseeing command of more than 4,000 Nevada Army and Air National Guard personnel and responsible for responsible for both the federal and state missions of the Nevada National Guard. The Adjutant General is appointed by the Governor of Nevada. From 2005 through 2009, Major General Cynthia Kirkland was the first woman to serve as the Adjutant General for the state of Nevada. Colonel Joanne Ferris became the first woman to command a brigade level unit in the Nevada Army National Guard in 2015. When she completed her command tour, her replacement was also a woman. Colonel Mary Devine. And on the left is my friend Charlie, I'm sorry, on the right is my friend Charlie Smith. During her career, Charlie had several firsts for women to include commander of the 321st Signal Company for the Nevada Army National Guard. She was also the first woman to serve as the executive officer in UNR's ROTC program. Deanna Burt is a United States Air Force Major General, currently serving as the commander of the Combined Force Space Component Command of the US Space Command. As a Brigadier General, a one-star general, she was the first woman to serve as Vice Commander, United States Air Force Warfare Center at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. Jeannie Marie Levitt is a United States Air Force Major General. She became the US Air Force's first female fighter pilot in 1993 was the first woman to command an Air Force Combat Fighter Wing, which was the 57th Wing at Nellis Air Force Base from April of 2016 through June of 2018. Lori Robinson, as an Air Force Captain in 1986, served as a female instructor at the U.S. Air Force Fighter Weapons School at Nellis Air Force Base. She went on to become the first woman to serve as commander of the Command and Control Operations Division of the Air Force Weapons School also at Nellis Air Force Base. She pinned on her fourth star when she took command of Pacific Air Forces, known as PACAF, in October of 2014. And on May 13th of 2016, Robinson became the highest ranking woman in the United States military history when she assumed command of the United States Northern Command, known as NORTHCOM, and the North American Aerospace Defense Command, known as NORAD. In 2017, First Class Brittany Spears and Specialist Cindy Robles reported to Fallon Naval Air Station's 609th Engineer Company as the first two combat trained soldiers assigned to any Nevada Army National Guard unit. Robles, who graduated from Sunrise Mountain High School in Las Vegas, attended the University of Nevada, Reno, where she joined ROTC. A 19-year-old Sears is a 2016 Galena High School graduate from Reno. She didn't want to be a 42 Alpha, an administrative clerk, and sit behind a desk. Going out on patrols and doing demolition was a big selling point for her. Since this is my presentation, I get to include one of my firsts, which is the picture at the bottom uh, center of this slide. I was the first woman to command Hawthorne Army Depot, uh, which is located about two and a half hours southeast of Reno in Hawthorne, Nevada. The depot was established in 1929 and so it was my honor to serve as the first woman commander of the depot. The photo on the upper left is Second Lieutenant Katarina Schumacher. She is the first woman to successfully complete the required training to operate a tank and to lead her own tank platoon 
in the Nevada National Guard. On the right is Chief Warrant Officer Cicely Williams. The Nevada Army Guard marked an important diversity milestone recently with the graduation of its first African-American female UH-60 Blackhawk pilot from Rotary Wing Aviation School. Williams grew up in Gardnerville, Nevada and graduated from Douglas High in 2002. She subsequently attended and graduated from the University of Nevada, Reno and received a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Chief Williams was, has been in the Nevada Army National Guard since 2010. She graduated from the U.S. Army Aviation Center of Excellence in July of 2017 to become a full-fledged certified rotary, rotary wing pilot. In 1970, women accounted for only 1% of the active duty force. By 1980, that number had jumped to 9%. And in 2017, that figure was at 16%. As more women serve, the more women veterans we have. In fact, women are the fastest growing segment of the veteran population. In 2014, Governor Sandoval established the Women, Arms, women Veterans Advisory Committee to address the needs of women veterans in the state of Nevada. Since the committee's inception, I've been the chair of that committee. And for me, it has been a great opportunity to work with and meet women veterans throughout the state. And it was my pleasure yesterday to read a proclamation from the state's virtual women's veterans conference where Governor Sisolak proclaimed March of 2021 to be Women's Military History Month for the state of Nevada. And so I thank all of you for celebrating Women's Military History Month with me today. This concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have.